The first time you secure a place of your own gives you a real sense of independence. You get to decorate the place how you want and you can have guests over whenever you want. If you are blessed enough for your first residence to be owned, kudos to you. But if you have to rent your first place like most of us, be sure you get the best deal possible. Are you aware of the best tips and secrets that work in the favor of the tenant? My name is Ronika Jacobs and you found my podcast, Strive for More, Your Best Life Now. While there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, you've taken the time out to listen to this one. So for that, I would like to say thank you. So without any further delay, let's get to it. Let's strive for more. I'm very fortunate that this episode is my 50th episode for the Strive for More podcast. The title for this episode is The Secrets of Renting That Work in Your Favor. My next guest, Justin Pogue, is helping people strive for more in the area of real estate by helping tenants truly understand the rental real estate process. Justin is a real estate consultant, and his services are sought after by property management companies, investors, and real estate consulting companies. Justin is also the author of Rental Secrets, which helps people to understand the power they have when it comes to renting. In this episode, Justin will share the realities of the rental business and dispel myths about renting. Hi, Justin. Welcome. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. How are you? I'm doing well, Renika. So happy to be here. Oh, this is great. Great. How's the weather where you are? The weather's really, actually really nice. There's not not a cloud in the sky and lots of sunshine going on. So it's a a good day. (laughs) Okay, so I have to ask you, how did you get into real estate and more specifically rental property? I got into real estate by accident, actually. I was in grad school working on becoming a management consultant, and I had prepped for all the interviews, gotten the internship, you know, went through the internship interview with flying colors, got the internship down, and what ended up happening was dot-com bubble burst. This is around 2001, 2002 time frame. And my 12-week internship got cut to six, and then that whole industry just stopped hiring people because all the clients were a lot of these high tech companies that were trying to figure out what they were going to do next. So it actually got to the point where those uh, management consulting companies were actually sending rescission letters to people they had already hired as in, thank you very much for buying a house near our office. We no longer need your services. So real estate ended up being my fallback position. And that happened because My mother had actually been a real estate agent back in the 80s, and while it never took off as a career for her, she was always interested in real estate investing, and she was just learning about buying properties, getting control of properties by paying the back taxes on them. So what we ended up doing was taking a trip, a road trip to Florida from from California, which is where I grew up, and uh, we drove through some different counties in Florida looking at what's called the lands available list, which is properties that are that the county has um, that you can basically get control of by paying the back taxes on them. So that's kind of how I started in real estate. And we actually did buy a few properties off of those lists and then sell them to developers. That was what got my experience in real estate going. Wow, man. Well, you know, it's interesting how 
we can watch our parents when we're younger and look at the, the activities that they are involved in and not realize the impact or the imprint that it's making on our brains. Yeah, yeah, because my mother was actually the entrepreneurial parent, so she was out trying all kinds of businesses, all kinds of different in investment opportunities and all of that, and I definitely got that bug from her. So do people really have the ability to influence what they pay for? I know you say that in your book, so talk a little bit yeah. about that. It's actually interesting because a lot of people treat renting a property like shopping at the store. You walk into the store, there's an item on the shelf that you want, there's a price on the shelf under that item, and people just assume that they have to pay that price. And in the store, you're not necessarily going to sit there and haggle with the cashier over, over you know, a loaf of bread or something like that. But when it comes to actually renting property, people do indeed have the ability to negotiate. And the first step in actually negotiating is to understand that you can do that, that it is a possibility. Um, and that's why the first chapter of the book is labeled the power, it's called the power of negotiation, because understanding that, that lays the whole foundation for the entire rest of the book about the different tactics and strategies that people can use when they negotiate. But the other key piece of it is thinking about renting from the landlord's perspective. How does the landlord think about their property and finding residents? Because the landlord has significant problems that they've got to overcome. They have problems with vacancy. They have problems with other competing properties in their neighborhood and also in other parts of the city that they're in. They have problems with maintenance problems. They may have structural issues. There's all kinds of problems that landlords are dealing with. And there really isn't a class that landlords have taken to take on all these responsibilities. Once you become a landlord and you own a property, you are, in effect, a small business. And whether you're prepared for it or not, that's the reality that you're taking on as a landlord. So now you mentioned landlords have problems with vacancy. So what does vacancy really mean for the landlord? So most people understand that vacancy means that the landlord isn't getting paid for that apartment. But it's actually much, much worse than that. Because when an apartment is vacant for a month, not only does, not only does the landlord not get paid, there's no way that they can recoup the money that they've lost. It's not like it's a car where, where if you don't sell it today, you can sell it tomorrow. That month of space rental is gone forever. In addition to that, when someone moves out of an apartment, there are a number of costs that pile on on top of that vacancy cost. The apartment needs to be cleaned. There may need to be repairs that need to be done. On top of that, in terms of finding a new renter, a lot of renters come to them through these online apartment search sites, and those sites get paid for every renter that they send the landlord's way who actually signs the lease. So there are a number of different costs associated with having an apartment become vacant. And in addition to that, that assumes that the vacancy may only last one month. That vacancy could be one month, two months, three months. The landlord really doesn't know. So when someone moves out, they're ba they've basically been signed up for a whole series of unknowns and a whole series of costs that they have to deal with. Okay, so if a person is out looking for a place to rent, and it may be a duplex or single-family home or single-family dwelling, and they're looking for a place to rent because they don't want to go through a huge corporate company and high-rise apartment or anything that way. They want something a little more private. So what is the best source of information when renting a property? Where should they start out? Should they get a real estate agent or is it just looking in the paper? Or how does that process work? In some areas of the country, there are real estate agents that do go out and find rental property for people, and they are paid a commission. But I would advise people to start out by thinking about what is it that you actually need? What neighborhoods are interesting to you and why? What amenities do you actually need to have in those buildings? Because 
the more, all things being equal, the more amenities a property has, the higher the rent is going to be. And I've seen it time and time again where people go and look at a community and they're all really excited about having a swimming pool that they end up never using after they move in. But they're paying to have it available. So if you're not going to use it, you're paying for something that you don't need. And another piece of information around that is to look at what amenities are in the neighborhood around where you're, where you're looking to live. Because if there's a neighborhood pool available, why pay for the neighborhood pool, which you're paying for in your taxes, and pay for the pool on your property through your rent? So knowing what you want and what you need when you're looking for a property is really important. In addition to that, I would also talk to the neighbors. Talk to other people who live on the property, who will live on that same property, or if you're in the case of a single family, talk to the people who live next door. Find out what the neighborhood is like, because you're not just renting a house or a dwelling. You're basically renting a neighborhood experience, and you want to find out about that um, firsthand from the people who are actually living there, because the person who is leasing you the apartment, they're you know, they have, they have the standard, you know, spiel that they tell people who come to look. And it puts a positive spin on the property. But if for somebody who's actually renting the property, they need to know, is that neighborhood park really a park that I would send my kids to? When the leasing agent says there's always great street parking available, well, is that really true? And how far away is the great street parking? Um, but the people who live in the community or the people who live next door, they'll be able to tell you that information, answer those kinds of questions without, you know, the positive spin that the leasing associate will put on it. Hmm. So talk to the audience a little bit about your book, Rental Secrets. What are a few tips or information, without giving the book away, because I definitely don't want you to do that, (laughs) but give us a few highlights. Yeah, so – Rental Secrets came about because I had this experience where I was sitting in the bookstore and I'm looking at the real estate section and all the books that I saw were written for owners, managers, and investors. And like there is a large group of people that are, that are vitally important to this industry that are being left out completely. And it was the renters. And most people don't understand that there are 43 million rental households across the United States that bring half a trillion dollars, with a T, to the table every year. So this is a huge market, and the renter, it plays an integral role in that. I also found it interesting because you can find resources on how to buy the best computer or how to, buy, how to get a good deal on a car or a refrigerator, but there really weren't any resources on how do I search for an apartment effectively such that I get the best deal. Um, And that struck me as odd, too, and that's really where this book came from. So the book lays out 10 different sources of power that people have when they go to negotiate, uh, when they go to rent a property. And I call it rental secrets because these are are sources of power that people really don't believe that they have, and they they really are available to them, and they really are quite powerful. So one of the secrets that I lay out in the book is I call it the power of flexibility because what happens is someone calls an apartment community and the person will answer a phone, you'll you'll answer the phone and you'll say, yeah, I'm interested in a two-bedroom apartment. And they'll say, great, we have two-bedroom apartments available. And they'll start to ask you a series of questions. Would you like it to be on the first or second floor? Would you like it to be near the pool? Do you need it to be near, would you like it to be near the laundry room? So what's happening when you're answering these questions is they are crossing vacant apartments off the list. These are apartments that they're not going to show you based on the questions, based on how you answer these questions. So once you get down to the end of the conversation, they'll basically say, great, I have one apartment that fits your needs. I have some appointments already scheduled for this afternoon. When would you like to come to work? So already now you're thinking, oh, my gosh, they only have one apartment. I I can't negotiate. There's only one. It's going to be gone if I try and negotiate. So you're already in this this state of of the fear of missing out. 
well, did you really need the apartment to be on the second floor? Did you really need it to be near the pool? Did you really need it to be next to the laundry room? Maybe you did, and if you did, then that's great. That scarcity is real. But if you didn't and you were just answering based on what sounded nice, then that scarcity only exists in your head. So you may not need to be next to the laundry room. You just may need a laundry basket that has wheels on it. Um, mm -hmm. So people should really think about what their true needs are and remain flexible. And flexibility is one of the powers that I talk about in the book, Rental Secrets. Wow, awesome. Thank you, Justin, for sharing that. Okay, so college students, <laughs> the days of living in a dorm are almost long and gone. I mean, uh, I know when I first started out in college, and I mean, that's where I lived. I lived in a dorm and, I mean, didn't have a mm -hmm. car or anything. And now college students, that seems to be – renting a property seems to be the way to go. They're finding a property that's close to the campus, mm -hmm. and they're finding roommates and needing to stay in that house to go to school. What are some strategies that will help college students find affordable rent or even negotiate their rent? Because they're college students, so it's not a lot of income coming in. <laughs> yeah, that's true. College students don't necessarily have a lot of income. What they do have are loan proceeds that are left over after the school takes out for tuition and fees and books and all of that. Um, so it's really important that going back to that um, going back to that initial phone call story to the apartment building that you may be looking at is remaining flexible in what you're asking for. And instead of letting them lead you down the path of, of those particular questions that they want to ask, better to ask questions like, what long-term vacancies do you have? Because the idea is to help solve their problem. Because the problem with the leasing agent is they need to lease these apartments. And there may be apartments that the leasing agent is working with that it may have a less than desirable view. It may have finishes that aren't as updated and nice as some of the other apartments. It may be located next to the street making it more difficult. And all of these things make it a little more difficult for the leasing agent to lease that apartment. But all of those issues can actually become negotiating points when someone goes to look at that apartment. Because every day that that apartment stays vacant is a day of rent that they will never, ever get back. Hmm. And that's um, even true with corporate properties, right? Not just individual that, land properties owned by a, a landlord. Absolutely. All of the strategies in this book apply to landlords because, and it doesn't matter if it's an individual landlord or if it's a corporation, they all have the same problem. If I don't have someone in the space, I'm not getting any money for it, and I can't get it back. That problem is universal for all landlords. And I also want to touch on for the college students, really look at the amenities that the building is offering you have access to a college campus. The campus is going to have all kinds of amenities that you're already getting with tuition. You don't necessarily need the apartment community with the pools and the hot tubs and the barbecues and all that. The college is already offering that to you. You don't need to pay for it twice. That makes so much sense. So then I'm going to shift gears a little bit from college students to nonprofit organizations because often they need a building mm -hmm. because that's where they run all their operations out of. So what advice yeah. can you give to nonprofit organizations who are renting their building? Should they eventually move towards buying a building, or is renting okay? I would say that there really is no substitute for the control that ownership provides, because once that building is owned, there are all kinds of steps that you can take to, to make better use of the building, change the building around, remodel it to fit your needs, and, and like that. Um, and once you own the building, your rent will never go up. But that being said, nonprofits have a particular set of resources that they can use, that they have available to them because they are nonprofits. So my advice to them would be be flexible about the spaces that you're looking at. They don't necessarily need to be pristine. They don't necessarily need to have all the cosmetic bells and whistles. And part of the reason I say that is because nonprofits typically have access to volunteers. 
people who are affiliated with their organization who are interested in coming down and helping out. So that means that you may take a building that, for example, doesn't have the carpet laid out in it or needs to be painted or something like that. And if you have access to those volunteers, they can come and help you resolve some of those cosmetic issues that the landlord may not have dealt with already. And that becomes a negotiation tactic for getting lower rent on the front end. And the work that those volunteers do will also help not only help the nonprofit, but they will also help the landlord as well. In addition, there may be opportunities to get some donations from like Home Depot or whatever, because they have like, for example, like Home Depot has the mistake paint section. Um, and they may be willing to donate that to a nonprofit, or they may be able to donate, you know, regular paint to a nonprofit, um, because that gets them, no, that gets their activities noted in the community. They're helping out this nonprofit who does X Y Z work in the community. Um, so those are resources and things that are available to a nonprofit that a for-profit company really wouldn't have access to. I heard you mention before about buying definitely in and having ownership is definitely the way to go because you have more control. But what can you tell people who have found themselves in a position where they, they can't buy and they're going to have to rent? Because, you know, sometimes people make us feel bad, like you should own, you should own, you should own. But then sometimes you may not be in a position where you can do that. So what can you say to encourage people when people are kind of saying things to them about, you know, why aren't they owning when they do have to rent? I would say this. In the case of the nonprofit that we were talking about earlier, nonprofits typically have a very long-term mission. So ownership is, is kind of supportive of their long-term mission. But ownership is not necessarily right for everyone. There are people, I have met people who are, for example, some senior citizens, who are like, I don't want the maintenance of a house. I don't want the upkeep. I don't want to be responsible for that. And when I rent, if something breaks, I call the landlord, they come and handle it, and I don't need to be involved in that. So there are a number of situations where renting is preferable and it works out better. It also works out better, especially for those who are just starting out, like renting and roommate situations and, and all of that. It fits the place where they are in their life right now. So there are a lot of advantages to renting that people need to understand. And not everybody is in a place where owning is feasible. And if owning isn't feasible, you know, these are the people that I'm really talking to with, with my book, Rental Secrets, about how to do that more efficiently and effectively. Owning is an investment just like any other investment, and people need to make sure that it is right for them at that particular time when they, when they start going down that road. And don't listen to all the people who are putting pressure on you because they are not in your financial world. You know, they're putting on you, pressure on you to buy a house, but they're not helping you buy the house. <laughs> yeah, where, where will they be if you buy the house and then you get a house you can't afford and the next thing you know you have to sell or you get foreclosed and now you're back to renting anyway when you, you were kind yeah. of – you know, you had your plan when you were renting. So you're right. I can definitely agree with you. It's, at times, renting fits the place where you are in your life and at the moment. There was one more thing I wanted to mention on that subject. Yes. People do go ahead and buy a house. There is a concept known as house hacking where you may buy, a say, a three-bedroom, two-bath house. And in order to help cover the mortgage, you may rent one of the rooms to – to someone and they pay rent for the room and that can help you cover the mortgage. So it's not just I have to buy a house and I'm going to live in it and I won't have any financial assistance. There are kind of broader ways to think about the house to help make that purchase happen. Awesome. Well, I just want to ask one more question. And all of my guests, I have one last question that I ask them that has nothing to do with the topic that we have been talking about. But it's just, you know, just for my listeners and myself just to get to know you a little bit better. So if you could tell your younger self something, what would you say? What would you tell a young Justin? I would tell myself two things. One would be to be more patient. When you 
when anyone comes up with an idea or a concept, it takes time for that concept to grow and marinate and for you to share it with other people um, who will, who, and if you're sharing it with the right people, they will have positive feedback to help flesh out that idea and make it more viable and valuable. Um, but that process takes time. So be patient with yourself as you're working through the ideas that you have. And the second point is related to that is to actually have more faith in the power of the ideas that you have. Because um, I think a lot of people assume that everyone else thinks like them and everyone else has probably had this idea, whatever it may be, and they haven't done it because it's not good or it doesn't work or whatever. But that's really not true. You're the only person who's had the experiences that you've had in your life. And your idea, whatever it may be, is being born out of those experiences. And it's unique and special because no one else has had those experiences. So really value the ideas that you come up with because they may be much more original than you actually think they are. Hmm. Well, Justin, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. Can you do me a favor? Please take the time to let everyone know how they can purchase a copy of your book or seek your consulting services. Absolutely. So the website is rentalsecrets.net, and the book is available at that website as well as on Amazon and uh, a few other online retailers. And they can also reach me through... Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And what I do on my social media accounts is every day I provide different real estate tips for both renters and landlords on a daily basis so everybody can start getting better at this landlord-renter experience and not feel the frustration that most people feel when they walk into a landlord's office. Any last words of encouragement for the listeners as they strive for more? Yeah, absolutely. All of you are more capable than you think you are. And please stop waiting for permission from someone else to share whatever gifts you have um, with, with the rest of us. And believe me, all of you, everyone, every person who's listening to this has some gifts that the rest of us would love to see in, in action. My final word of encouragement would be to, to stop waiting for permission to share your gifts with, with the rest of us. Man, Justin, that was awesome. I really hate to close this out because I'm enjoying talking to you, but that's our time. Justin, I wish you nothing but blessings and abundance in your life to come for you and your family. And I thank you so much for taking the time out and sharing your knowledge with me and with my listeners. Take care. Thank you. Whether you are a tenant, property manager, or landlord, it is important to know your rights and this of the city and state policies for renting. Establishing good rental history builds a solid foundation towards home ownership. For the budding wealth builder, owning rental property is one doorway towards financial freedom. Rental properties have their pros and cons, but all in all, remember to do your research and decide what's best for you. Remember to visit my website at striveformorepodcast.com to view the show notes or follow any of my other guests. You can purchase a copy of Justin's book or find out more information to follow him on any of the social media platforms. Continue to strive for more and live your best life now. See you in the next episode.